In Brazilian reals, would, would our answer have been different or the same? What do you think? Yeah, yes or no? Would the answer have been different? Would we have decided no? When we did the calculation in dollars, we found the NPV for Disney and we said yes, let's invest in the project. We have a positive NPV. Okay? What about if we did the calculation in the local currency, in Brazilian real? Do you think the answer would now be no or still yes? Yes. Still yes, still yes right? So the, here the answer wouldn't be any different. Because we change the currency, we should still have the same answer. Okay? Just we have to decide at the start. Are we going to use dollars or are we going to use Brazilian real? So we just decide on the currency. It should be the same answer no matter what currency we do. So the next point we're going to talk about is uncertainty before we finish return because our a lot of our decision was based on the guesstimate. Do you understand guesstimate? Guesstimate is a made up word. Do you understand guess? Do you understand estimate? So we put those words together. We get guesstimate. Okay? So we're guessing and estimating about revenues. Are we sure about the future revenues? No. Are we sure about the future costs? No. We made an estimate based on the historical data in the other parks. Is the historical data always correct? Does the history always follow the same? Does the future follow the same way as the history? No, it doesn't, right? We saw in the subprime mortgage crisis in the US, house prices were going up for 20 years, right? So people thought, oh, house price will still go up. House price has been going up for 20 years, okay? But the house price didn't, they went down. So the history cannot always give us the accurate view of the future. So we make estimates or guesstimates about revenues and costs for the future, okay? If we are wrong, maybe we made a mistake to take the project. So what we're doing now is we're going to deal with this uncertainty, okay? Do you understand uncertainty? A 
Uncertainty means we're not sure. This, these are just guesses. So based on our expected cash flow, cash flow means cash coming in, cash going out, mainly revenues and costs. Okay? And the estimated cost of capital, the proposed theme park looks like a very good investment for Disney. Which of the following might affect your assessment of value? So look at this list and answer the question. Okay? So read the list and answer the question. Okay, so uh, Angelina, can you answer the question? First part. All of the above, right? So all of these things can be different in the future than we thought. This happened to Neuro Disney, okay? The crowds were smaller and they spent less money than they thought, okay? So maybe that can help us a little bit because of the historical experience of Euro Disney, we can add that into our guesstimate. But Rio Disney could be even worse, right? The Olympics are on in Rio at the moment. Brazil has the Zika virus. Do you know the Zika virus? So a lot of people are not going to the Olympics because of the Zika virus, okay? Do you understand the Zika virus? Do you want to catch the Zika virus? No? The mosquito has the virus. So for example, there is the Zika virus in Brazil. Are people all going to go, many people going to go to Rio Disney? No, the tourism is down in Brazil these days. The economy is not going well, okay, because of the Zika virus. And even the Brazilian people might not want to go out much or go there, right? So we could have that kind of a problem. And the revenues could be smaller than we thought. Actual costs may be higher than the estimated costs. Tax rates. Okay? Interest rates. All of these things can happen. So the second part of the question, uh, how would you respond to this uncertainty? Have a look at the second part and think about the answer. What are you going to do? We have those kind of uncertain things. So how are you going to deal? Deal with means what are you going to do about the uncertainty? Okay, so Park Jion, or is Park Jion? What would you do? You have some uncertainty. What are you going to do? You have four options. Which option are you going to take? You're not going to invest in Rio Disney? It's too risky? Just stay at home and watch TV? Never run any business in your life? Huh? Just shout at your mother. Mama! I'm sick! I'm sick too! Like that? Watch TV, drama, play the computer game. It's good life, right? Good life. Just don't take any project. Okay, no, we can't do that because then we're never going to do any business because there's always uncertainty. Okay, so let's have a check and see, the other hands. Who's going to wait for the uncertainty to be resolved? Hands up. Hands up. Okay, who is going to ignore it? Hands up. 
who is going to try to better understand the uncertainty? Okay, so that's the answer. We try to better understand the uncertainty. Right? We can't wait because uncertainty is never resolved. We can't ignore it because then we can. Uh, maybe we could go bankrupt or lose a lot of money. So we have to try and understand it better. So we try to do that. Uh, we talked about payback. Payback is one way of dealing with uncertainty, right? So uh, we say, well, look, we can get our money back after 10.5 years, we think, okay? So the theme park is going to run for 30 years. So it should be okay. We should get our money back at least, okay? Do you understand? At least get back our money? Yeah. All right? Well, the discounted payback is 17.7 years here for Disney, so... Uh, so another way is checking how does our NPV or IOR change when the variables change. Okay? Uh, do you understand variable? Variable is something which can change. Like revenues can change, costs can change, tax can change. So when we analyze the effects of changing a variable, we hold everything else constant. But in the real world, variables move together. So for example, revenues go down, costs go down too. But in this case, we just calculate revenues go down, but everything stays the same. Okay? This is called sensitivity analysis. It's helping us to make better decisions. Okay? So we can see in the book, if you want to follow in the book, about sensitivity analysis. It's on the page uh, 87, okay? So, for example, uh, we change the revenues and we see, like, we change, the, or we can change the cost, we change, we say the rent is going to go up in our restaurant. For example, sometime in Korea they can change the chance suddenly, right? After two years, suddenly change the chance up a lot, your business is going well. So the business in our restaurant, the rent or the chance would suddenly go up, right? So we just put that into the analysis and we see if the chance goes up suddenly, what happens? Do we lose a lot of money or are we still making a profit? Okay? Do you understand that idea? So we change one variable and see what happens if that happens. Gives us a better idea. Uh, simulations on page uh, 89, simulations. In simulations, we... Sim do you understand simulation? Simulation is like, not real, but uh, just something that can happen. So, we look at here, this is revenues as a percentage of predictions. So, we have a probability Probability is the same here for all revenues. The revenues between can be, we guess the revenues are here at 100%, okay? But the revenues could be higher than we predict with the same probability. And the revenues could be lower than we predict with the same probability, okay? So probability is the same, but the revenues change, okay? We could do the risk premium. For Brazil, the Brazil country risk could go up, so our cost of capital could go up. Okay. Uh, what's, in this case, the probability is that it's going to be the same. But there's a small probability that Brazil can improve and get less country risk. Okay. There's a probability here that Brazil can have more country risk. For example, the government falls, or there are big demonstrations. A couple of years ago in Brazil, they had big demonstrations about the World Cup, okay? And there was a lot of problems in the economy. So, that could happen with this probability. And then, this is the ex operating expenses. Are the expenses, we said the expenses should be about 60% of revenues, but the expenses could be higher, or the expenses could be lower than we expected. So we make this kind of probability diagram using the computer software, okay? Do you understand probability? So this is like, there's a 1% chance that the operating expenses will be 35%. There's a 50% chance the operating expenses will be 
there's a 1% chance it would be 85%, and so on. Okay, so we make that data, and then we make a simulation. Simulation means we put this information into the computer software, there's a 1% chance of this, you know, 50% chance of this, 50% chance of this, and we press enter, and we run 10,000 simulations. Okay, it's like 10,000 times we run the project, Okay, so sometimes the project is going to be really bad. For 1% of the time, the cost may be up here, very high. Okay, Brazil may have a crisis and it could be up here. And the revenues could be low. Okay, that could be one simulation from 10,000. Okay, do you understand what I mean? We run the simulation like we're going to have the park. And we do that 10,000 times. So we're looking into the Pretending we run the park 10,000 times, and what happened? Sometimes it was good results, sometimes it was bad results. Okay? So we get this kind of a thing. So when there was the bad, all of the bad times, it was here. We would lose money. Net NPV is minus, net present value is minus 3 billion. Okay? Most of the time, this is what we expected. Our NPV would be about 3 billion. There is a possibility that we could make an MPV of 9 billion. So that's what this kind of simulation tells us. So this just helps us to understand. If we look at this graph and we see there's this possibility that we don't make a positive MPV. Okay? Just this much. And then all of these possibilities that we will make positive MPV. Are you going to invest in the project or not? Yes, right? You can see just this small part, if everything goes wrong, if Brazil has a political crisis, okay, if the costs are much higher, if the revenues are much lower, only in, in that bad cases we can end up here, right, in the NPV. But it's a very small percentage, right, we can see on the graph it's just a small amount. Most of the time the chances are we're going to be making a positive NPV, so we should run the project. So that kind of simulation is useful. We can use the computer program for our project and we can get an idea by looking at the graph what are the chances that we will have a negative NPV under zero. Okay, and how much of the time will we be over the NPV? Okay? So it just helps us to get the uh, get that kind of idea. So now you're this, the financial manager at Disney, and we, I give you the result of this simulation. The median NPV, the average NPV, is close to your cash flow calculated NPV of 2.8 billion. However, there is a 12% probability that the project could have a negative NPV. So we look at the graph, 12% probability we have a negative NPV. And the NPV could be a large negative value. How would you use this information? So I'll answer the question. How are you going to use that information? So choose A, B, or C. things in those data. So 
if our cost of capital is going up, we can try to find some way to uh, reduce our cost of capital in another way. So it just helps us to manage the things on the project. So uh, we can do this kind of analysis in equity terms. As we did it in cost of capital in ca cost of capital, in capital terms. But we can do that just for equity, okay? Equity investors, but it's not widely used, it's just a side point, okay? We do that mostly for the cost of capital, but sometimes just for the equity investor, they want to do the calculation just for equity. So the accounting returns would be return on equity instead of return on capital, okay? And we use the cost of equity instead of cost of capital. So we compare the return on equity to the cost of equity. If we use the cash flows, we take out the debt payments. We take out the debt payments and our hurdle rate is the cost of equity. So that's just a side point. So just uh, briefly, we can just briefly look at another example of, uh, just to review, another example of the cash flow analysis. So this is a paper plant for our crews. It's a paper company. They manufacture paper. They are going to make a paper factory. Do you understand factory? Okay, so it's maybe more simple than Rio Disney. Okay? They need an initial investment of 250 million Brazilian real. At the end of the 50 year, they will need to spend 50 million more to update the plant, like maintenance. Okay? They are going to borrow 100 million uh, at this interest rate using a 10 year loan. <coughs> The plant will have a life of 10 years, so they think the factory will just last for 10 years. Maybe after 10 years, the techno there will be some new technology or new machinery for manufacturing paper, so we won't need it. So we're going to sell the factory at the end of the 10th year. Okay. So in this case, we can do the example for just doing the calculation for equity investors. So the hurdle rate is the cost of equity, okay, instead of the cost of capital. So uh, we <laughs> break that down by year then. We have, we break down the debt payments by year. This is the debt at the start. The interest expense, principal repaid. Do you understand principal repaid? and the total payment and the ending debt. So we pay back the loan over 10 years and we end up with zero at the end. So we have a lower, because we're paying back principal, the interest expense is lower every year. So we're interested in the interest expenses. So we look at our incomes, okay? Revenues, again, revenues, expenses, operating income, and net income, okay? Uh, in this case, we take away the interest expenses because we're doing cost of equity. In the last one, we use cost of capital. So in cost of capital, the cost of debt, or the interest cost, is already included, okay? But when we're using cost of equity, the cost of capital, cost of debt is not included, so we have to include the interest expenses. So that's what's different here, for cost of equity calculation. Okay, and we get the net income after interest expenses. So, uh, then we can do the ROE, the book value, using the accounting way. We get our net income every year, okay? And we divide that by the uh, book value of equity. So we have income over equity equals return on equity, okay? So return on equity, we have the different values for the years, gets as high as 43%. The average is 36% return on equity. So the equity investor who invests their equity in the company is getting a return of 36%. So just to review return on equity briefly, I start a restaurant and I have 10% uh, equity and 90% debt. Okay? Or I have just 100% equity. Which one is going to give me a higher return on equity? This one or this one? 10% debt or 
Ten percent equity or one hundred percent equity? No, the first one is going to give me a higher return on equity because here I only invest my money and I get a lot of debt. Okay, so if I let's say I invest that's ten thousand dollars. Okay, and here I invest a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so let's say the restaurant makes an income of a hundred thousand dollars next year. Okay. That's its income, okay? Or let's say, that's too much. Let's say $20,000 next year is the net income. So for A, for A, the return on equity, we are going to have to minus the interest payments for the B. Right, this is A and this is B. So B will be minus interest payments. But A, we, our sorry, both of them is minus interest payments. We're doing return on equity. So let's say the interest payments is 5,000 for A and B is zero. Okay, no interest payment in B. So then the net income for A is going to be 15,000. Okay? And for B is going to be 20,000. Okay? So B has a higher net income. That makes sense, right? They don't have to pay the interest payments in B. In A, they need to pay interest payments. Okay, do you understand? Okay, but what is the return on equity for A and B? Return on equity is going to be income. Return on equity is the net income over equity. So if we calculate for A, what's the ROE? It's going to be 15 over 10. Right? What's that in percentage? 150%. Okay? A. B is going to be 20 over 100. So B is going to be 20%. Right? So we can see that A has a much higher return on equity. It means that I invested $10,000 of my money. Okay? I got back $15,000, so I made 150% of my investment. Do you understand? In this case, I invested 100,000 of my money, but I only got back 20,000. So I only made 20% of my original investment. Okay? So we have. That's why we don't really use ROE because ROE can be misleading. Okay? It, ROE can encourage companies to take a lot of debt was one of the problems in the financial crisis. The man some managers were getting paid their bonus based on the ROE. So because their bonus was based on the ROE, they decided to take more and more debt. Okay? If we take more and more debt, we can have a higher percentage for ROE, return on equity. Okay? So that can be problematic. So just I wanted to review the ROE. Okay? So ROE in this case is up to 36%. Okay? And the cost of equity is 18%. So in this case, it looks like good investment. Okay? But we need to change it to the cash flows. So we add in, again, we do the change to the cash flow, we get net income, we should notice, plus depreciation, minus capital expenditures, minus change in working capital, Okay, in this case, minus the debt repayment is added in. And we get the cap because that's cash going out. Okay, so cash flow to equity, we have our cash flows every year. From year zero to year 10. And then we find the present value. We do our NPV. We write our cash flows here, and we find the present value of the cash flows. Okay, that's the NPV. And we find out we have positive cash NPV. Okay. So the IRR is also positive, we find out. Okay. So uh, that's just doing this with the equity analysis. So we can also have uncertainty in this project. The uncertainty may be paper prices. One big problem for companies that deal with raw materials, the price of raw materials is very volatile, it changes a lot. Do you understand timber? Timber or those kind of things? 
Price changes a lot. You can change 50, 100% in one year. Paper, the price can change a lot too. Okay? So the price of paper and pulp. Pulp is what you make paper from. It's kind of white, gooey material from the tree. Those prices can change. So we just make the analysis. If the price changes, what happens? Okay, so this is the paper price. If the paper price is going to be high, we get the higher IRR. Okay, if the paper price is low, we get, it's possible that we could have a negative NPV. So again, this is the scenario analysis. Okay, so we see how the uh, variables change. Another variable that could affect this company is the US dollar, the exchange rate. Okay? Because if they're selling paper in the US and the US dollar gets weaker, it's bad for their business. Okay? We can do other ways, we can hedge this, there's other ways to manage that. Okay? Uh, do you understand about hedging? Hedging? We should explain about that a little bit. Uh, so, hedging means that we try to deal with the risk by making a kind of insurance. Do you understand the insurance contract? So, in this case, the company has two main types of risk, the paper company. One is uh, the pulp prices, okay? The pulp price is their main cost. Their main cost is pulp, okay? So what, how they can hedge a against the price of pulp is what airlines do. For airlines, their main cost is oil. Do you understand oil? Right? So what do airlines do? They can make a forward contract. Do you ever wonder why the price of oil doesn't, or the price of the airline ticket doesn't change much, even though the oil price changes a lot? Okay? Because the airline can lock in the price of the oil for two years. Do you understand to lock? Lock. Okay? They can make a, for, a future forward contract, also can be called future contract. It means that they make the deal with the oil company. You're going to deliver the oil to me in two years at today's price. Okay? Do you understand? So the airline already made the contract to buy oil for two years at the high price or the low price. So if the price of oil changes, it doesn't affect the airline that much, okay? That is called hedging. Hedging, okay? Hedging means like insurance or locking, locking in the price, that kind of thing. Hedging is protecting ourselves against risk. So just dis discuss this question with your partner. The value of this factory is very much related to pulp prices. Okay, pulp is our main cost, main, like the airline, oil, okay? There are futures forward and option markets on pulp that our crews can use to pre hedge against this price movement. Should it do it, yes or no? So discuss with your partner, what would you do if you're the financial manager in this company? Are you going to make the contract for two years to fix the price? Or are you not going to make the contract for two years? You're going to just buy every month at the same price. So just, or a variable price. So discuss with your partner. Which, do you, which are you going to do as a financial manager in this factory? Make the contract for two years to get the delivery at the same price? Or just buy every month at a different price? You can think about the question for the airline. It's the same question. If you're working for the airline, are you going to buy the contract to buy oil for two years at the same today's price? Or are you going to wait and buy, buy oil every month? Which are you going to do? Discuss with your partner. Contract is yeah, yeah.
Okay, and then the second question is very similar. It's about the exchange rate. Okay, so we have the US dollar. If the US dollar gets stronger, it's good, right? If the US dollar is stronger, our paper is cheaper in the US. Okay, our currency is weaker, our paper is cheaper. If the US dollar is weaker, our paper is more expensive. Okay? So what are you going to do? Are you going to lock in? You can make a contact with the bank where you lock today's exchange rate. Do you understand? Are you going to lock today's exchange rate or are you going to wait and see? Lock today's exchange rate means for two years I can keep today's exchange rate. Right? Or am I going to wait and see what happens? US dollar gets stronger, our paper is cheaper, it's good for our company. US dollar is weaker, our paper is more expensive in the US, it's bad for our company. So what are you going to do? Lock in the dollar or not lock in the dollar? Exchange rate. Discuss with your partner. You're the financial manager, so you need to make that decision. US dollar gets stronger, we're happy. US dollar gets weaker, we're not happy, we lose money. Are you going to lock the exchange rate or not? Not lock the exchange rate. Using those kinds of contracts. Okay, so let's have a show of hands. Who says yes, I want to lock the prices? I want to hedge or lock the prices. Who says no, I don't want to lock the prices? Okay, so that would be the correct answer, right? So companies, companies hire people, right? Companies hire people. They provide the salaries and jobs for people. So do companies like to gamble? They don't like to gamble. Oh, we can win big. Great, we get more money. But what if we lose? Everybody lose their job, right? Do you understand? So companies don't really like to gamble. Co companies like stability, stable income over the longer time. Okay? So in that case, it's better to hedge. Right? Unless, unless for example, the pulp price is really high today and we think it's, we're pretty sure it's going to go down, then we don't have to hedge. Okay? Or the US dollar, the same. We analyze the US dollar and we think that it looks like Brazilian real is historically very weak, it's going to get stronger. Only in those cases we might decide. We can also use option contracts, which we pay a fee and we have an option to break the contract. Okay? So that can also, we can also use that. So we use this kind of thing to decide whether to hedge or not. What is the cost of hedging the risk? Because there's some costs to locking the price, you have to pay a fee for the contract, right? Negligible or high? So, it's anyway we have to ask, is there a benefit, right? Yes or no? Okay, then we can also ask, can marginal investors hedge this risk? If, we're, if it's not going to make the firm bankrupt, maybe our investors, if we have the marginal investor is an institutional investor, maybe they already hedge that risk. Okay, so... We make that kind of decision, but basically we analyze, when we're deciding to hedge, we analyze, we look at the US dollar, Brazilian real. We think, what's going to happen? Is it going to get stronger or weaker? We look at what did the experts say? Do the experts say it's going to get stronger or weaker? Okay? We get an idea about what's going to happen. But generally, we're going to have to try and lock it somewhat. We can find some options, contracts, that kind of thing. Okay? So, Do you understand acquisitions? Acquisitions is buying a company. So when we make acquisition is also like a project. We have to use the investment decision. Okay? We make the acquisition. We have to decide yes, buy the acquisition by the company, or no, don't buy the company. So let's look at an example of the acquisition for uh, Tata Chemicals. So rules that apply to traditional investments should also apply to acquisitions. Okay? In that we analyze the company with the acquisition and we calculate the NPV. 
if it has a positive NPV, then yes, acquire the company. Okay? If the IRR is higher than the cost of capital, yes, acquire the company. Okay? If not, don't acquire the company. Okay? In estimating the cash flow on the acquisition, we should also count in any possible cash flows from synergy. Okay? So when we one of the reasons we acquire the other company is we think there might be synergy. Can anybody give me an example of how there could be synergy from one company acquiring another company? For example, Microsoft by Nokia, so now they can produce telephones. Yeah, so Microsoft doesn't have good telephone technology, right? So they acquire Nokia, and they're going to improve their smartphone a lot. Okay, Microsoft smartphone products, so they got some synergy. Nokia can get some synergy, right? They can make, they can also get some better software system. We can see that this is one reason why emerging market companies often acquire developed market companies. For example, Indian or Chinese companies, they may acquire a UK, small UK company. Why? The UK company does the financial side very well, okay? So the Indian company acquires the UK company, they get the synergy of they can manage the financial, like hedging, that kind of thing, right? They can manage the financial area, so they get that kind of synergy. Do you understand? Uh, new technologies, right? That kind of thing. Better marketing. UK is also good at marketing. So they can get the good marketing skill. And their company gets some synergy. So we have to try and calculate that. Okay? Uh, the discount rate should be based upon the risk of the investment to the target company and not the acquiring company. So, Sensi Technologies is a publicly traded US firm that manufactures color, flavor and fragrance for the food business. So this is common these days. We can get the big company from the emerging economy like India, which is acquiring the small company from the US or Australia. Okay? So Tata Chemicals is an Indian, a la very large Indian company which manufactures fertilizers and chemicals. So based on the 2008 financial statements, the firm had this operating income, these revenues, tax rates, depreciations and so on. It has a debt to capital ratio of 28.57%, debt to equity ratio of 40% and pre-tax cost of debt of 5%. So we look at the data for the company Okay, we're going to use US dollars rather than rupees. Uh, Sensing Technologies is a food processing company. So we go to the list, you know the list now, you, need, you saw for your assignment. The unlevered data is 0 0.65. Okay? So we calculate their cost of capital using their beta, right? You're doing this for your project. First of all, you find your cost of equity and the cost of debt, and then we do the weighted average calculation to find the cost of capital, okay? 6.98%. So, we estimate the cash flow to the firm for sensitive technologies, okay? We use the after-tax operating income plus depreciation, minus capital expenditures, and so on. So we calculate the cash flow, okay? And we estimate that these will grow 2% a year. The cash flow will grow 2% a year. Okay, so next year we have these cash flows and it will grow. Instead of doing the 10 year calculation, just we just say 2% uh, growth rate. Okay? So then we can estimate the value of the firm. We can estimate the value of the operating assets, which is the cash flow next year over the cost of capital minus growth rate. So we calculate that to be 1.559 million. Okay. So then we have, this tells us the value of equity is equal to the value of the assets plus cash minus debt. So this gives us the equity value of the company using cash flow analysis. Okay. We get the cash flow, we get this kind, this is a perpetuity equation, cost of capital minus the growth rate. Okay, and this tells us the, the assets, value of the assets. If we want, uh, we can add in cash, okay?
Okay, and then we have to take away debt, right? So equity equals assets minus debt, if we look at the balance sheet, okay? Assets plus equity, assets equals equity plus debt, okay? Equity equals assets minus debt. So that gives us our estimate of the equity value, and then we compare this to the market value, okay? So it's lower than the market value, okay? Our estimate of the cash flow is lower than the market value of equity. So we have to make up the difference with synergy. We need to make $43 million of synergy if we want to buy this or acquire this company, okay? So this is also like valuation. This is one way of valuing. People say, well, how can we value? We could do a whole chap. we have a chapter on valuation, we might not have time to finish, right? But this is just a quick way we can look at the valuation of a company, okay? It's in chapter 9. So, do you have any question about what we studied today? So just in conclusion, uh, the investment analysis is an important part of it's the most important part of the financial management, okay? We have to think about the uh, uh, calculate the cost of equity, cost of debt, cost of capital, compare that to the cash flows, cash flows on the project. Then we have to think about synergies, we have to think about different scenario, different scenario analysis, and that helps us to understand and make a decision about whether to do projects or not to do projects. Acquire companies or not to acquire companies. Okay? So, uh, do you have any question about your project assignment? What's your question? Uh, can you show me one example of how you I have a lot of data and I don't know what to do. Even I have steps, but it's too difficult. You want me to show you how to do the cost of equity? Okay, so uh, the class time is just finished. That will take five minutes, right? So just if students want to see that for their assignment, they can stay. If you want to leave, you can leave. Okay? So we can go back to the presentation on the cost of equity. Mainly we're talking about the beta, right? So first of all, you need to find a product type. Did you find a product type? Okay, we find a product type and we find a beta. Did you find a beta for your product type? How many businesses do you have? Two businesses. Okay, then you need to find the debt to equity ratio. Did you find the debt to equity ratio? No finance. Well, then we uh, break down the business by business, right? Did you break down by business and list the beta? Okay. And we need to find the value to the firm. So, uh, Here we have the revenue. Did you break down by revenues to businesses? Yeah. And find out the firm value proportion percentage? Uh, well, I said simply you can use revenues or you can use estimated value to sales if you want. There's the link is in the final one. This is estimated value to sales. Market equity plus debt minus cash or the revenues. But well, it gives that for each business. So you go to the spreadsheet, sell, you can find the estimated value for your business for each business. So multiply the revenues by the estimated value. It's going to be more than one or less than one. And then you get a new number. So the estimated value in this case is 2.3. In this case it's just 0 0.27. So consumer products is not adding much value. So even though it has high revenues, consumer products is not making much profit. Our revenues are high, but the costs are also high. 
we're not making much profits. So it has lower value. So it's more accurate. We multiply this by this, gives the estimated value. Okay? Whereas media networks, we make a big profit on media networks. Revenues is high, we make a lot of profit. So we multiply by two. It's, more, it's worth more value. But if I said if you want, you can just do revenues. Okay? If you want, you can do this. So then we know the firm value proportion of each one. Okay? And we know the beta of each one, then we can find the unlevered beta of the company. 0 0.733. How we found that? We just sum up and multiply by... Uh, this multiply 58.9 by 0.7. Multiply 29.8 by 0.5. Multiply 9.8 by 1.3. Multiply 1.3 by 1. Add together. Sorry, I didn't understand. How do we find the value? Uh, you need to use this is this here information you get from the link and multiply 16 multiply by 2.13 is 34. Yes. Multiply 2.8 billion by 0 0.27 is 768. Yes. Do you understand that some consumer products? It's very competitive and they don't make much profit. So even though the revenues are high, it's not adding much value to the business. So then, do you understand you get your average data for the company? Okay, and then we use the debt equity ratio to make the, the equation for the levered beta. Okay? So. Uh, We need to go on to the cost of capital. Uh, so, sorry, just I'm looking for the, do you have your book? I'm looking for the equation for the leverage. Uh, maybe it's quicker to find in the book. On page uh, 55. So we have the unlevered beta is equal to the levered beta. And then on the next page, page 56, we have levered beta is equal to the unlevered beta. So you have your unlevered beta. Multiply by 1 plus 1 minus the patch rate by the debt equity ratio. This tells you your beta. Okay, then the other information you need is the risk free rate. That's no problem, right? And the risk premium. Yeah, so if you have those three things, you should be able to get the cost of equity. Alright? Uh, actually, sorry, we didn't talk about the uh, country, right? Where did they get to? Did you do that for the risk premium? You were able to do that for risk premium? Okay. Yes. Uh, so, uh, this, is, uh, this is the cost of debt. The cost of debt. Yes, you don't have to do this. This is optional. Yes. But, uh, this was the six. What was that six? Thank you.
И вообще должно быть удобно. Извините, мы съедем. Наверное, вот Thank you. 